And we are live. Welcome to the Node Guardians YouTube channel, where we discuss all things blockchain, cryptography, smart contract programming, and decentralized web. I'm Sam, hosting this episode as usual with Kayleen. And we are welcoming today Mustafa Albassam, who is the CEO of Celestia Labs, the main company that's contributing to the Celestia network, which is a scalable and general purpose data availability layer for decentralized apps and trust minimized sidechains, rollups. Mustafa, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very well. How are you guys? Pretty good. Uh, for, for the people that do not know you, it would be nice to know a little bit more about your background and how you ended up building Celestia. Sure, yeah. So I've been interested in decentralized networks and systems from a very early age. And so I uh, heard about Bitcoin, you know, first when it came out in 2008, 2009. And I started a PhD focusing on layer one scalability in 2016. And there I worked on one of the first sharding protocols called Chainspace. And then that was later spun out into its own project. And the company behind it was acquired by Facebook. But I decided not to join Facebook. And instead, I started Lazy Ledger, which is now known as Celestia. Okay. And what is uh, Celestia at a high level? At a high level, Celestia is what we describe as a pluggable data availability layer. Now let's unpack what does that mean? Traditional blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they have a very similar design where the nodes in that chain do everything. Um, they do consensus, data availability, and execution. But what we've realized is that if you kind of take the idea of a blockchain back to its core components, you can actually split up a blockchain into multiple components. And those components are consensus and data availability and execution. And so the idea of Celestia is basically if we reimagine blockchains and went to kind of like square one, what is the most minimal blockchain you can create? And that's why it was originally called Lazy Ledger, because it's like a lazy blockchain. It doesn't do any computation or execution. The only thing you can do on it is basically add data to it. Like you can dump data on it and it will order that data for you and make it available for you, but it doesn't execute transactions. And it turns out that that's basically the only thing you really need for their own blockchain because people can develop their own applications on top in the form of their own execution layers using roll-up technology. Because the whole way that rollups work is that rollups are basically blockchains that use a different blockchain for consensus and data availability. So the core idea is like you can split the execution and consensus in the blockchain so that you can give developers the freedom to define their own execution environments. Yeah, so I think Celestia also tackles the data availability problem. So could you explain how security is solely derived from data availability without a settlement layer like Ethereum? Sure. So as I mentioned, Celestia doesn't execute transactions. It only orders them and makes them available. And the idea of a modular blockchain stack is that by separating the components, each component can become more specialized. So because Celestia only focuses on data availability, we can optimize for higher data availability throughput because you can specialize in that just one task. And then it's more efficient if each layer in the stack specializes on the specific task that they're suited for. And so with Celestia, our core mission is to scale data availability to provide abundant block space for all blockchain applications. And we use a number of core technologies to achieve that, including one called data availability sampling, which basically allows users to verify the data availability of, of the chain without having to download all the data. Okay. And this new design where you're decoupling execution for consensus, what kind of scale, what magnitude of scaling can we expect? What kind of performance we can expect from this solution compared to not legacy blockchains, but even some alt L ones that are trading lately or the throughput that rollups should theoretically reach? Sure. So ultimately, the scalability has several different factors to it. But the core reason why rollups are more scalable than just standard smart contract platforms is because rollups have off chain execution. So that means you can create your own rollup and the nodes in that rollup. They only have to worry about executing the transactions in that rollup. That means you don't have to share computational resources with other applications. Kind of like how in Cosmos, you can create, you can create your own Cosmos chain, but the validators don't have to execute every other Cosmos chain's execution uh, transactions. So rollups provide more scalability because it's basically like sharding computation. And then because the L1 does not do computation, it only does data availability, you get benefits from specialization because the data availability throughput of that chain is no longer limited by the fact that the nodes also have to do computation. So like depending on the rollup, you can, you can get anywhere between a 10 to 100x 
throughput increase, depending on how much data that rollup uses on the L1. But the way that we look at scalability is that scalability is throughput divided by the cost for end users to validate the chain. So it's no good only increasing throughput because the whole point of Web3 on blockchains is that it's meant to be decentralized and that users should have the ability to independently verify the correctness of the chain. So like if you make it that too expensive, if you make full nodes too expensive, all you're basically doing is building an expensive database. And that's why um, a big focus of Celestia is that we want to support light clients and support secure light nodes so that users can, for example, even run a blockchain node on their phone that verifies the correctness and the validity of the chain. So you mentioned that the throughput not only depends on throughput, but also it's divided by the cost of the fees. This might be a dumb question, but could you explain what Celestia is trying to do in terms of calculating the fees? Like, are they trying to decrease the fees of every transaction that is happening on Celestia or the rollup or anything related to that? I don't mean the transaction fees. I mean, the, the cost for like end users to actually run a node. If you're only interacting with a blockchain through centralized services, you're not actually having the security guarantees of a blockchain because you have to trust that centralized service. But it's about like how expensive is it for the users to run their own node, their own full node, for example, that actually validates the transactions on the actual chain. Because the whole point of a blockchain is that you don't have to trust any third parties. But, and, and users, if you have to use Coinbase or something like that, you basically have to trust a third party. So it's, it's basically like banking all over again. But if we have light nodes, then users can actually directly be first class citizens of the network and verify that the transactions are valid. And so one obvious way to increase the throughput of a blockchain is just increase the block size. But increasing the block size of the blockchain does not increase the scalability because it also, if you increase the block size, you're also increasing the cost for end users to actually get any guarantees about the chain because they have to download more and more data. But light nodes and light node technology allows end users to validate the chain without having to download all the data. That's what one of our big focuses are, to enable efficient light nodes. Uh, but of course, um, having lower low fees is important. And to have low fees, you, you need ab abundant block space. Um, and that's also a, a big goal of Celestia. It would be cool to dive a little bit more into the whole erasure coding mechanism and the methods that you guys employ to be able to recover the, the data out of you know a smaller set of data that's put it this way. There's also another uh, concept that's very interesting, sovereignty. And I believe that with Celestia now, people can just bootstrap their own execution environment without having necessarily to have a set of validators and find a way to incentivize them and coordinate with all of those. There's, a, there's another way now to have security for custom environment, execution environment. Could you tell us more about the use cases that we have as a developer or as someone who wants to build something? Yeah, for the first question, as I mentioned, one of the big aspects of Celestia is that concept of light nodes. And light node basically allows like anyone to run a blockchain node on their phone or the computer. And they can verify the data availability of the chain without having to download all the data. And to achieve that, we use a scheme called data availability sampling. And the way that works is that the validators, when they create the block, they apply something called an erasure code to the block. An erasure code is like a technology that's used everywhere, including like CD-ROMs, for example, or satellites. When you scratch a CD-ROM, your computer can still read the data and you can still play the CD-ROM. And the reason for that is because the data inside the CD-ROM is what's called erasure coded. It allows you to take one megabyte of data and blow it up to two megabytes of data, where the, where the second half of the data is the erasure code. And it gives you a property so that if any half of the data is missing, you can recover the entire data. So it's kind of like it gives you some extra redundancy that if any data goes missing, you can still reconstruct the data. And so like validators use this scheme so that if they try to hide any of the data, network can still recover it. So now it's no longer the case that 100% of the data needs to be available. Only 50% of the data needs to be available. So if light nodes want to test the availability of the data, what they can do is they can assume that they have to check that at least 50% of the data is available. And to do that, they can randomly sample, like randomly download random pieces of the block. And if the validator was malicious, then they would effectively not be able to respond to all the requests because the light client would have requested a part of the block that is unavailable. So using that scheme is that you can get very high probabilistic guarantees that all the data in the block is available. But uh, to answer your second question about sovereignty, 
a big like kind of like a social aspect of Celestia is this idea of sovereign communities. And this is also a big thing in Cosmos as well. Like the Cosmos community, we, all, we believe that one of the like biggest use cases of blockchains or pretty much the main use case of blockchains is this idea of a community computer, a sovereign community. If you imagine in the 90s, 90s was the personal computing revolution. Like everyone had their own computer and everyone started using social media and then it was very individualistic to some extent. But you can imagine now we have the community competing revolution. The communities have their own state machines that you can create. You can spin up your own tenement chain using the Cosmos SDK, and your community can now have a computer with a computer program defined by the community that's automatically enforced by the network. That's basically a sovereign blockchain because for the first time in history, we have the ability to enforce agreements and contracts between people without relying on any higher level third party. Before blockchains, if you wanted to create a organization or a company with like a number of shareholders or a group of people, the only way you could do that is if you incorporate that under like some law of some country or jurisdiction, the US company law or UK company law. And then that's ultimately enforced by the judges and the court system and justice system of, of that country. And that law only has effect or power because it was like created or by parliament or constitution, which has power because there's a social contract among the people in that country that they might not rebel or, re or have a revolution against the government. But for the first time in history, blockchains allow you to shortcut that by creating a kind of like an organization, like for example, like a decentralized autonomous organization that does not require any high level power to enforce the agreements in that organization. Like it's just enforced automatically by the network, like uh, using cryptography and peer-to-peer and -peer networks. And so it's something I describe as a top level social contract. By a top level social contract, I mean some kind of like agreement among people that is the top level in the sense there's no social contract above that. So for example, the social contract of the people in the country is, top, is a top level social contract, which gives the government the law authority and so on and so forth. You can think of blockchains as top level social contracts because the agreements in the chain are enforced by no one else, by no higher authority, but you don't need a police force. You don't need a court system. The code is enforced by the network. And so because it's a top level social contract, the community for that chain is sovereign. And that's a very powerful new social tool that we've had for the first time that blockchains have enabled um, for the first time in history. But the problem is like, if you just create a smart contract on Ethereum, if you, if you want to create a DAO and you create it as a smart contract on Ethereum, then it's no longer a top level social contract because your smart contract is on a layer one network shared by other contracts. So you're inheriting the social contract of the Ethereum community. The Ethereum community can like push EIPs, for example, without your approval, that can be useful sometimes. So like, for example, the, to reverse the DAO hack. But now if there's a hack now, they're not going to reverse your contract because you're not a sovereign community. But if you're a Cosmos chain, for example, you're, you are a sovereign community, like the community can decide to hard fork the chain or to do upgrades without approval from any other Cosmos chain because it's a sovereign community. And the goal of Celestia, or a big part of it, is to allow people to create sovereign chains with lower friction than Cosmos. Because right now, if you want to create a Cosmos chain, there's a lot of overhead because you have to create your own validator set and you have to maintain a decentralized validator set. And if we imagine a world with millions of sovereign chains, then it's very unlikely that they're all going to have a secure validator set. So the goal of Celestia is to remove that friction by making it possible to launch a sovereign chain as a roll-up by inheriting Celestia's shared security in the form of consensus and data availability that you'll be able to spin up like a roll-up chain in seconds and have it be fully decentralized and secure. In today's landscape, we, we've, had, um, we've had a few, let's say, shared security solutions that have been proposed. We've had the, the ICS with the recent Game of Chains testnet for the Cosmos SDK-based systems. We're he hearing about, again, DA, data availability that's coming up. How would you position uh, Celestia's data availability solution and consensus layer, let's say, in, in this landscape? Yeah, in terms of interchain, security or, or interchain staking. Interchain security has a very similar model to kind of Polkadot. It's a model where all the validators in that chain have to also validate and compute and execute the transactions of other chains that they interchain stake. That's not a very scalable model. So some people, including myself, see interchain staking and security. It's not really as a shared security solution, but more as a solution to effectively have subsidiary chains under under like a holding chain or like a holding company. 
if the Cosmos hub wanted to integrate Cosmosm or something like that, they could just do it as a subsidiary consumer chain, for example, instead of like having it directly onto the main chain. Even Celestia, for example, if the Celestia community wanted to enshrine a settlement layer to Celestia, it could be done as a consumer chain using interchain security. But as a, as a shared security solution, it's not really something that I see scaling to millions of chains because of the fact that the validators of that chain, like if you have 100, 100 validators in that chain, they have to recompute every transaction in the chains that they interchain secure or are consumer chains. But with rollups, that's not necessary because rollups, their computation happens off chain. So you don't need a, a large set of validators. All you need at minimum is one sequencer because if that sequencer is dishonest, you can challenge them with a fraud proof or you can have a ZK proof. Yeah, if you post a validity proof and it happens to be to be wrong on mainnet, it, it's actually tolerable to have the sequencer run by someone that's malicious because there are ways to prevent any form of damage. And what you basically said is that for the interchain security, it doesn't scale because the operators have to run multiple workloads and this security cannot be distributed to like 50 child chains because it would be too annoying from a DevOps standpoint to, to maintain everything. So it's kind of bottlenecked by this, right? Yeah, exactly. Here's something that we've been hearing that interchain staking is actually quite expensive for validators because yeah. they have basically have to validate multiple chains at the, same, at the same time. And it's risky in the sense that if you actually do something wrong on one of these new chains that's bootstrapped, you actually get slashed on your Cosmos Hub validator. And that's one effect that you would like to avoid, I, I guess. And I think it's pretty much the same thing. On eigenlayer, you're basically like commoditizing Ethereum security and you're, you're adding slashing conditions. Uh, you can basically secure other systems uh, outside of Ethereum and should something go wrong, you're slashed on your ETH stake. And I think it's the same thing. You also have to run another client that's specific to the chain you're, you're, you're supporting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I Iconlayer has a sl slightly different model. There's no documentation. So I'm going only by what, what I know. But as far as I understand, it allows like rollups to create their own kind of DA, it's not like a single DA, but like rollups can like create their own instances of the DA commitment. But the main difference with Eigenlayer is that you can use ETH as collateral for the chain, but you can't slash data availability on chain. So it's not really quite data availability level guarantee. It's more like a proof of custody because you can't slash data availability on chain, on the Ethereum chain at least. What I would be curious to know is if you could again list all the potential use case that could derive from a solution like Celestia and the new designs that we can have. Sure. So the ultimate like goal of Celestia is from a technical standpoint is that we want to make deploying a new blockchain as easy as deploying a new smart contract. Like in the future, we will have roll up as a service providers. In the future, you'll just be able to, you won't have to worry about any blockchain infrastructure whatsoever. In the future, you'll, you'll just be able to code up your app or uh, design your application and submit it to a sequencing service that will automatically deploy your app as a roll up on Celestia, for example. And you wouldn't have to trust that sequencing service in any way, because if they misbehave, then you will have a fraud proof or a ZK proof. And you won't have to trust them necessarily for censorship resistance either because the rollup can inherit the censorship resistance from the DA layer like Celestia. This is a very powerful um, way to develop because compared to deploying a smart contract on Ethereum, for example, because deploying a smart contract on a shared smart contract platform has many limitations, including the fact that you're limited to the execution environment that layer one gives you. And also the fact that you have to share computational resources with all the other smart contracts on there. We've seen a very similar evolution for web two. Back in the early days of the web, if you wanted to create a website, the only way you would do that is your server was on your computer and people will connect directly to your computer. So most people didn't have their own website because that's quite off overhead to maintain a web server. But then in the late 90s or early 2000s, we had shared web hosting providers, GeoCities, for example, or Bluehost and, and Dreamhost. And that allowed people to upload the website code to those providers and they would run them on a shared servers. They would usually give you a specific set of programming languages and software on the servers like PHP and MySQL. And that's very similar to smart contract platforms today because you upload your smart contract code to Ethereum or Solana and it runs it on the same world computer or the same chain as everyone. But then obviously Web2 evolved and now we have virtualization, we have DigitalOcean, we have AWS, and now everyone can instantly spin up their own web server and install anything they want on there, any programming language they want, any execution environment they want without having to actually maintain physical hardware. 
because the infrastructure providers maintain that physical hardware for them. And so what we're trying to achieve is something very similar. We want to allow people to create their own rollups, create their own chains in the form of rollups without having to maintain their own layer one infrastructure. And so you can kind of think of rollups as virtual blockchains on top of a physical blockchain. So to enable some of the goals that you mentioned that you're developing secure light client nodes, I was just wondering what's the technical infrastructure behind that? Like how does it actually work on top of everything in Celestia? So the main reason why we're focusing on light nodes is because I think that's currently the biggest criticisms of Web3 right now. The whole point of Web3 is that it's meant to be decentralized, but it's not really decentralized if everyone is just using Infura via MetaMask and having to trust centralized endpoints to interact with the chain. Ultimately, that's just like a interacting with a centralized database to some extent. But before Ethereum, Bitcoin had very good light node support. If you download the Bitcoin wallet on Android, it will actually connect directly to the Bitcoin network. You will submit transactions and get data directly from the Bitcoin network. Like you don't have to connect to any centralized services like Infura or anything like that. So I think it's a great shame that Ethereum depopularized light clients or like made everyone assume that light clients are hard, but they're not really that hard. Like Bitcoin achieved them before Ethereum. So I think we need to see a shift back to light clients. And with Celestia, we're trying to design light clients that are almost as secure as full nodes because full nodes are the most secure type of blockchain node because they actually validate all the transactions in the chain and verify that that they're correct. But light nodes, obviously, they can't do that because they're running on normal people's computers or, or, or phones. So we've designed technology to allow light nodes to get almost very similar guarantees to a full node. That's where data availability sampling comes in as I mentioned earlier, but that's also where ZK proofs and fraud proofs come in. Because with ZK proofs and fraud proofs, light clients can get guarantees that the transactions are correct without actually having to re-execute all the transactions. Because then instead of re-executing all the transactions, they can just rely on a ZK proof or a fraud proof. So basically there's always a window where someone can create the fraud proof to challenge something, but this is the job of full nodes in that case, right? Yeah, so you still have full nodes, but you only need at least one honest full node. The full nodes generate the fraud proofs. So you mentioned erasure coding as well before. And so right now, Celestia, from what I understand, is using erasure coding and fraud proofs to sort of guarantee that data availability with also a Reed Solomon Merkle tree encoding. How is this like different from the structure of Ethereum's case where it uses like KZG commitments? Why was there a choice? Like what's the reason behind the choice of using the composition of these two? Yeah, so Ethereum also in, in the full bank charting roadmap also plans to do use data availability sampling. And then EIP4844 is like a middle step to that where it allows people to submit data that is committed to the block in the erasure coded format. But the main difference with Celestia is that EIP4844 commits to the block in a different way. So Ethereum will commit to the block using something called a KCG commitment, but we just use a standard Merkle tree using, using a standard hash function, SHA-256. The main difference is that in our case, if the erasure code is constructed incorrectly by the validator, there'll be a fraud proof. But in Ethereum's case, KZG commitments don't need fraud proofs because KZG commitments, they already prove the correctness of the code. But the reason why we're not using KZGs is because we already started like a year ago and we're shipping a bit earlier. And there's some concerns around the efficiency of generating KZG proofs. It's quite slow to generate these KZG proofs. And so the validators will need very expensive proofs to compute the proofs. And so that's why we're using the standard scheme. So, so you guys updated in your blogs that there were improvements in your erasure coding, and now this like allows Celestia to do erasure coding like thirty times faster. So, is this related to how like KZG commitments are slow? Like, is that why? Uh... So, it's not related to the erasure uh -huh. encoding itself. It's related okay. to how you commit to the data inside of it. Usually, we just use a Merkle tree, right? But KZG commitments don't use Merkle trees; they use a polynomial commitment. But the step before that is actually computing the erasure code. That's not the problem. The problem is the step after that, which is once you've computed the commitment, you need to be able to prove to the light nodes that some piece of data is inside of the commitment. With a Merkle tree, that would, that would be just like a Merkle proof that involves like a branch to a specific leaf in the tree, which is very cheap. But with a KZG commitment, it involves something called an opening, which involves some expensive cryptographic computation to compute a proof that some piece of data is inside of the commitment. 
Okay, and you're not working with KCG now because it's not really aligned with your vision of decentralization and sovereignty. It would make the operating the network less, let's say, inclusive as running the prover would be something that's very resource intensive. And so for now, that would be one of the reasons that made you not choose such a system. Well, the main reason is just the throughput cost of it. Yeah. Our end goal is to get way higher data throughput than EIP 4844 has right now. And the more data you have, the more expensive it is to compete, compete these commitments. But that being said, we are um, kind of ex exploring other ways to um, like ZK proof the correctness of the data commitment. Like we're also exploring using stocks, like you, you can stock proof the correctness of the code and the, and the Merkle tree. But we're also exploring that as an alternative way other than KCG commitments. If that can be done efficiently, which looks like it actually might be possible, especially with um, FPGA accelerated provers, then we'll be able to prove the date commitments without any extra changes to the Celestial Core Protocol or without any like hard forks to it or changing the actual commitment scheme. Okay. And can we foresee other existing chains that could use Celestia as DA? Would it be something that makes sense for blockchains that have higher data availability capabilities by default? It's definitely possible for all our chains to use Celestia as DA. For example, we we're working on something called Quantum Gravity Bridge, which is a data bridge between Celestia and Ethereum that will allow Ethereum smart contracts to use Celestia for data availability. But you could also imagine that other Cosmos chains can use Celestia for data availability. There's different possible ways that we could do that. But one way could be like to use IBC. Maybe you can introduce IBC connection and then a special data availability IBC client inside the chains that allow contracts inside the Cosmos chain or transactions inside the Cosmos chain to reference data inside of Celestia. Okay, and what would be the way to ensure maximal liveness for a system like Celestia? Because what if you have hundreds of rollups and chains that are plugged to Celestia and you're experiencing like system failure? What would be the tweaks in the design of Celestia that prevent such a potential liveness hazard? Well, I mean, in terms of liveness, um, we're just using Tendermint for consensus. And so like liveness depends on the consensus protocol that's being used. So we just inherit the liveness guarantees of the Tendermint protocol. And I think that will ultimately depend on ensuring that we have a decentralized validator set to ensure that um, no one can easily censor any transactions or destroy the liveness of the chain. Yeah, because we've seen some Tendermint-based systems that just went down. I mean, it was probably because they were adding some other blocks on top of it, like Cosmosm whatsoever. I think Juno had an issue like that. And sometimes Tendermint-based chains, they can also have a, a good chunk of their nodes that are not available because they're all snapshotting at the same block. I yeah, was just curious to know what, aside from the, the consensus mechanism, if there were any aspects, methods that could make Celestia uh, overcome any, any kind of attack on that aspect. If there's bugs or issues in Tendermint, that's definitely something that should be addressed and fixed. But in terms of like liveness, we've been doing very heavy in testing um, internally. We've developed our own testing infrastructure using something called TestGround, which allows us to like spin up hundreds of validators and thousands of light nodes. So we've scaled that infrastructure to like over a thousand nodes. We're planning to scale that up soon to 5,000. And that kind of allows us to kind of like stress test the network and identify any kind of issues in the network or bugs, whether they're liveness related or safety related. And that's really kind of helped us a lot over the past few months to, to analyze the performance of the network and to test for any bugs that could affect their performance or of liveness of the chain. So I think, yeah, ultimately, the liveness of the guarantees of Tenement are pretty standard and pretty good. But in practice, obviously, there's a lot of software and quality assurance issues that can affect liveness, even if the protocol is theoretically good. And I think it's just a matter of like, having really good testing infrastructure to identify those issues before they arise. Okay. And speaking of testing, we've had the Metro Test Network. We also have, there will be like the Arabica IT that's coming up soon. Could you tell us more about those, the main learnings out of those, what we're exactly testing on these phases? And actually, how far are we from the proper mainnet launch? Yeah, so Mocha was an upgrade over the previous testnet, Mamaki. And okay. um, the, the problem with Mamaki is that we upgraded to Tendermint, I think, 0 0.35. We were one of the first projects to test Tendermint 0 0.35 on a proper test network. And Tendermint 0 0.35 has a, had a new peer-to-peer -peer protocol that wasn't tested properly and it had a lot of issues. Like it was generating blocks extremely slowly, multiple minutes of delays, 
before the next block is generated. So in the in Mocha, we downgraded back to Tendermint 0.34, which is much more stable. And there's also like a number of other upgrades in that testnet as well, including a new erasure coding scheme. Other than Mocha, could you explain about Celestiums and how mm -hmm. Celestiums offer options for rollups to have scalable data availability? Sure. So Celestiums, they were relating to what I mentioned earlier about the quantum gravity bridge. We're building a data bridge to Ethereum so that Ethereum smart contracts will be able to use Celestia as an off-chain data availability solution. But they're not quite rollups because rollups, by definition, need on-chain data availability. For example, Ethereum rollup cannot use Celestia as an on-chain data availability layer because it's off-chain from the perspective of Ethereum. So um, effectively, you have other off-chain data availability solutions that are alternative to rollups, like Validium, for example. Like Val Validium is like a ZK rollup that uses off-chain data availability. And so Celestiums are basically our spin on Validiums and optimistic chains. They're effectively um, like side chains or L2s that are like rollups but they, they use off-chain data availability instead of on-chain data availability. Do you think that Celestia could have some like limitations or concerns when it comes to the fact that it doesn't have a settlement layer embedded into the network? For example, because there aren't smart contracts in the data availability layer, like wouldn't there be restrictions on how you can't really bridge the native asset to the data availability layer? Or is that something like the quantum bridge thing is doing right now? Yeah, so that's a good question. And we don't have a settlement layer on a bet enshrined into Celestia. And like the main reason why we, we kind of like decided that right now is for several reasons. Like we want Celestia to be as minimal as possible and focus only on data availability. But more, more importantly, we want Celestia to be credibly neutral because there's other people right now that are building settlement layers on top of Celestia. But if we had our own settlement layer, for example, then that would no longer be credibly neutral to the other people building settlement layers on Celestia. And so I think to enable more innovation, credible neutrality goes a long way in, in, in enabling developers to innovate without being at risk or being concerned that the community will favor one particular solution or a roll up or settlement layer over the other. And yeah, that does mean that you can't bridge Celestia to rollups in a trust minimized way. You can still bri you can still bridge them using IBC, for example, but it won't be trust minimized bridging. It will be like committee based bridging. We do plan to enable IBC on Celestia, so you'll still be able to bridge uh, Celestia tokens using IBC. So it's not like you won't be able to bridge them. It's like you won't be able to bridge them like directly using a trust minimized bridge. But yeah, it also fundamentally goes towards what do we think is the main purpose of a token, or like what is the main value accrual mechanism of the token. And if we think that the Celestia token will be, would be used as collateral in a trust minimized way for DeFi, then yeah, maybe there's a strong argument to enshrine a settlement layer to Celestia, but it's unclear to me that's the case. Like even in Ethereum, USDC is more used more as collateral than ETH. And that's probably going to be more, more and more the case. So this, I think there's a kind of a trade-off here between being incredibly neutral and uh, unlocking innovation and potentially being used as collateral for DeFi. But the main value accrual cool story, like the main economic model of Celestia is that we think that the only way that Web3 can be economically sustainable is by providing a scalable service to billions of users. Right now, if you look at the current protocols and L1s, Ethereum, for example, they accrue a huge amount of transaction fees, not necessarily because they're providing a wide service to billions of users, but because transaction fees are extremely high. And like the whales are happy to pay that high transaction fees, but it's not really benefiting the mainstream users at scale. But we think that if transaction fees are lower, you can uh, have an economy, economy of scale where you're serving more, way more people than, than today, then that's potentially more economically sustainable than what we have today. And, and, and the last thing is that, as I mentioned before, if, if the community of Celestia did decide that it's in the best interest to enshrine a settlement layer, then that could be th theoretically be done by having a consumer chain to Celestia main chain. I have a question that might sound absurd, but le let's say you have Celestia, the Celestia network has been running for like 20 years. You have thousands of execution environments that are running and that are basically le leveraging ce the Celestia network. And you would still need to have full nodes in order to generate fraud proofs, right? And you would have to manipulate tremendously huge data sets should the, the usage of the Celestia network actually explodes. So what do we do when all these chains reach critical mass 
And we're still hoping that there will be someone with the entire data set that would come to challenge, um, you know, malicious events. Sure. So in the case of data availability for proofs, you don't necessarily need the entire data set to generate a fault proof because we use what we describe as a two-dimensional erasure coding scheme, which means that if you want to contribute towards generating fault proofs in the network, you could just download specific rows or columns in that two-dimensional square, and then you can generate fault proofs for particular rows or columns. And to help facilitate that in the future, we're planning to have something called a partial storage node. So that if you want to like help store the data on the selection network or make it available, you don't have to commit to storing the entire chain. Maybe you only have like 100 gigabytes or terabytes of storage. You can commit to running a partial storage node and only storing part of the chain. Pretty cool. I remember the Mozilla Fellows program back in, uh, in August 2022. I think it was lasting on, on three months. I'll be curious to know what, yeah, what were some of the ideas that finally came out out of this initiative and also curious to know what would be the path today to to build on Celestia, to receive support, engineering support or, or, or funding, what would be the, the road to follow on, on that aspect? Sure. So our modular fellows program consisted of two sets of, of fellows. There was the main fellows and then there were also what's called honorary fellows, which were like projects that were already building on Celestia. And there were several kind of interesting projects that came out of that. One of the interesting projects that came out, there's someone building a Celestia name service on Celestia. But another interesting project that came out was a project called FuelMint, which takes the Fuel virtual machine and then creates an ABCI compatible wrapper around it and make it work with Rollkit. So that was very interesting because to experiment with adding new execution environments to Rollkit, there's also um, some interesting projects by honorary fellows as well including Dimension, which is they're building a settlement layer for Cosmos-based rollups that use they use Celestia for DA. And then we also have projects like Sovereign Labs and and um, Eclipse, if you've, heard, if you've heard of them. Like Sovereign Labs is building a SDK for building Sovereign ZK rollups. And Eclipse is building rollup infrastructure, which includes allowing you to run Solana, the Solana virtual machine as a rollup. Yeah, I've definitely heard about it. And... Uh... We've also seen a few partnerships and integrations uh, lately, I believe with Saga and uh, quite a few other ones. Could you tell us a bit more about those? Yeah, we definitely have a very rapidly growing ecosystem because I think many developers kind of see the value of a modular ecosystem. It unlocks a lot of innovation and there's like a flywheel effect where you're building Lego pieces that are very easy to compose. Uh, yeah, in terms of Saga, they're exploring creating a sequencer as a service offering via interchain staking you can get sequences for your rollup via the interchain staking mechanism. So instead of like stake interchain staking to get validated for your chain, you can interchain stake to get sequences for your rollup. Okay, pretty cool. Yeah, I think that we explored the ways to get involved with, with Celestia. We've had quite an update on the latest moves and initiatives that you guys have conducted. Is there anything else that you would like to share with, with our dev community? Yeah, I mean, um, if you want to learn more, we have like a... There's a, there's a good learn section of our website, celestia.org slash learn, which gives which has a lot of uh, articles about the basics of modular blockchains. So I recommend checking that out as well if you're interested. Well, thank you, Mustafa. I'll make sure that all the relevant links are in the description below. And as usual, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section and to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the content. Mustafa, thanks again, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you for having me.